Hi there, everybody out there watching, whether you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or on my YouTube channel. Uh, today, I have the privilege, the honor, and absolute joy to be joined on the QCast by the one and only legend from Leicester himself, Mr. Peter Sage, otherwise known as the Extreme Entrepreneur, and a few other things as well, which we'll find out about later. <laughs> How are you, Pete? Welcome. Thanks, Steve. No, uh, doing great, and a real, uh, real pleasure to be on uh, on the QCast. Thank you. Looks like the dogs got the best gig in the basket there, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, they were out in the mountains with me at 4 a.m. this morning chasing rabbits. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're time for them to rest. That's good. Is there, is there actually a 4 a.m. in the morning then? I thought there was just one in the afternoon. For, for some people, it's when they just come <laughs> out of the club. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, the best, it's the best time for me. I'm, I'm a morning guy. I'm a battery. I wake up fully charged and I wind down at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so you're not living in the UK at the moment, right? You're living where? In uh, Tenerife, in the Canaries, just off the, uh, the west coast of Africa. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I always remember, I mean, I've been there uh, many times, but not for a long time. And I remember sort of... Uh, being re-motivated to go back there many years ago when I saw um, saw a documentary. You know Carl Froch, boxer, world champion boxer from Nottingham. He was going off to uh, yeah, well, basically he did his training camp in Tenerife because he could run, he could train at the height on Mount Tady, yeah. And obviously the heat, the humidity, and then like we were just talking about, when he got back to the UK to slightly colder climbs, you, you realise the benefit of that, yeah? So how long have you been down in Tenerife? Uh, just over a year. Yeah, I'm, I'm a sunshine guy. That was pretty much why I moved. Yeah, as, mm -hmm. as you know, as a, as a fellow Brit, yeah, I, I didn't see the sun until I was 12. No, 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 no. So, the extreme entrepreneur, you started your first business at the age of about two and a half, I think, was it? Or was it, or was it, was it the ripe old age of three? <laughs> How did that go? Oh, wow. Well, I, yeah, my, my, my pre, um, I, I guess, 17-year-old uh, official first business, yeah. uh, I did a lot of stuff at school. Uh, I still got, uh, I think, a memory that's vague. I can't really remember too much about it, but my mum certainly filled in the blanks. And uh, she turned around to me and told me the story one time. She said, when I was six years old, I came out of the, uh, the school gates and she was waiting for me with all the other mothers. And the, the headmistress at the time, her name was Miss Yem. She was one of these old kind of like stalwart battle kind of headmistresses. Yeah. And uh, she was also <laughs> a teacher to a lot of the parents, you know, in the generations before. And everyone was still afraid of her, even the moms. Right, so, and she comes out and she looks around, she goes, Mrs. Sage. And my mother was like that, and everyone's like, uh-oh. Uh, and uh, yes, Michelle, come here. And my mother walks over, like a, a little student. She yeah. says, I think your son's going to be a businessman. So why is that, Michelle? Well, in art class today, uh, all of the children uh, drew some sweets and colored them in and cut them out. And your son went and sold all of his and took everybody's dinner money. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that was a sign of uh, uh, my budding entrepreneurial uh, sort of spirit, as spirit. it were. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, there was always that kid. I know there was a kid at um, kid called Shish at art school who's sadly no longer with us. Um, but uh, he was a proper, you know, this lad was... Um, he was always the one selling the sweets. He was always the one selling like the coolest new sort of little gadget that we had at school in those days, you know? And then with the money he'd made for it, he was lending other kids the money and charging them interest as well. This is at like 12 years old, yeah? But he was an Indian and that's his whole family. And then when he, when he grew up in his early 20s, he was trading gold and stuff like that before trading gold amongst normal people was, uh, was a normal thing to do like it is now, yeah? So you can, always, you can always spot the. So actually, what was your, your first, you say 17, um, what was your first business at the tender age of 17? What did that look like? Well, I, I worked for my dad for a short time when I left school. I dropped out of school at 16. Yeah, I, I knew pretty much early on that school essentially for me taught me only two things, which is how to pass tests and work for somebody else. Sure. And neither of those were going to be on my agenda. And I also had a challenge with the job. And I know there's a lot of people on LinkedIn here, a lot of professionals. I mean, obviously, you've got CEOs and business owners, there's a lot of professionals, career professionals as well. And I, I totally get that. But from my perspective, uh, all being individual, I saw 
uh, a flaw in the whole employment aspect. And again, I was 15, 16 when I noticed this and it sort of hit me like a truck. And it was like, well, hang on a minute. If I go out and get a job, which back in the late eighties, 200 quid a week for a school leave, it was pretty good money. You know, some yeah. of my friends were saying, Hey, that's what I'm earning. Uh, and I'm like, even if I was to get a job for 200 pounds a week, clearly the job is worth more than 200 pounds a week. Otherwise there'd be nothing in it for the business owner. That uh, makes so, sense. I get that. Yeah. So therefore by taking a job, I will always be settling for less than what I'm really worth. Yeah. And I, and I had an issue with that. And so, yeah, I, I dropped out of school at 16. Uh, I worked for my dad for a short while, which I'd, I'd never recommend because yeah, uh, never, if you don't work for your parents, you realize they never pay you enough. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, the, the other flip side to that is I had a friend says, yeah, I, I worked for 10 years in a family business. It was the worst thing to, uh, I, I ever did. Uh, I says, why is that? He says, it wasn't my family. <laughs> I got fired. But uh, I was earning 40 bucks a week, <clears throat> yeah, 40 pounds a week at the time. And I remember turning around to my dad and I said, hey, dad, I'm, I'm leaving at the end of the week. I said, well, what are you getting into, son? I said, well, look, I have no idea, but I've got a belief, which I still have, which says, if you jump in the deep end, you can only swim. And as a result of that, I took my 40 bucks, my last week's um, wages. I paid my mom 10 pound board, which you know, I don't know if kids still do that, but that was what I was paying at the time. Uh, I paid my mate 10 quid, which I owed him. And I had 20 pounds left to my name. And I walked into a wholesaler's that was renowned for trade only selling toys. I blagged my way straight through yeah, the sort of check-in, walked up and down the aisle, started taking notes and somebody comes up, manager says, sir, can I help you? I'm like, no, not really. He says, well, uh, do you have an account here? I'm like, <clears throat> not yet. He says, well, you know, can, I, can I help? I says, well, look, I'm a market trader. I specialize in toys. Yeah, I'm, I've got stalls at Nottingham, Newark and Peter and all these high level like sort of market trader stalls. Uh, and for me, I was telling the truth in advance. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I basically said, look, um, I've been using so-and-so. And, -so, and I, in those days, no Google, obviously. I mentioned the next one down in the yellow pages. And I said, uh, somebody recommended you. And he said, oh, certainly, sir. Give me a trade card. Open me an account. Didn't ask to see any form of proof of business. And I had my last 20 pounds. I bought 15 bucks for the toys. And I drove to a car boot sale. And, and I had an old clapped out mini. Yeah, in the days before minis were cool, right? yeah. the old Italian job, original Italian job type mini, but not the Cooper. And because uh, the rule was I could work in the scrapyard, which is what my dad owned, and I could drive any car that nobody else wanted to buy in the junkyard. So you can imagine the level of, yeah, the privilege. High yeah. You know, <laughs> high quality at that point, right? Uh, and so uh, what I did was I, I drove to a field, a uh, car boot sale in Leicester, and I wound down the window. And I remember handing my last five pounds through the window to the stall owner, like the, the, the sort of farmer on the field. Uh, and I got my little, I drove to my little spot in between some other cars. I got my blanket out because I didn't have a pace table. I, a, it wouldn't fit in the car. Uh, and B, I couldn't afford one, but I had a blanket. And I laid out my 15 pounds of the toys. And I stood there and I ended up selling everything for 30 bucks. I doubled up. Wow. And I went back the next week. I bought 25 pounds of the toys from the wholesalers. My mom gave me credit on board because she could see I was doing something. And I went back the next week, put my five pound through the window, wondering if I'd ever see it again. And I sold a lot for 50 bucks. And I built up and up six, seven, eight weeks until I got enough stock to cover an official market store. And I started right. standing at the markets in Leicester. And my first business was called Pete's Toys. And my, my official catch phrase, if you like, was Pete the Toy Boy. I was 17. Wouldn't work today. <laughs> Well, you definitely qualified as a toy boy. That, you know what? That is, I've never told you this before, and we've known each other a while, to say the very least, yeah? Um, I think thick end of 20 years, how scary is that? But um, that's very similar, because I left school at 16, and uh, I had a thing called a Saturday job back in the day, yeah? Which was on a fish market, so there were no jobs around. Uh, I lasted about two minutes on a young, thick, and stupid YTS scheme. Yeah. yeah. So what what could I do? So yeah, cobbled a bit of money together, like you say, and I set up a fish business. Yeah. And um, again, within within the space of just honestly a few months, I was earning. I had pockets full of cash. Yeah. I was meeting my friends in the pub who'd stayed on and done A levels and the were working at the bank in a quote unquote proper job, respectable, actually doing what they want, their parents wanted them to do, yeah? Uh, and I was earning 10 times as much money as them. 
and I was working pretty much when I wanted. The only problem with that fish job is the cats followed you home, you know? I just had this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, never get, the fish market. Yeah. You never get rid of a smell, but, uh, and you, but you never go hungry either because you eat what you've got left over. So that was, that was the first, uh, your first foray into uh, the world of entrepreneurialism. So what came next after, uh, after the toy job? Well, one of the biggest lessons that I took out of that, I left my dad in June, and by October, I'd made my first thousand. Never had a thousand, never had a four-figure bank statement before. Mm. And for me, the magic of that was the fact that I'd made that money, I'd not earned that money. And that was a defining and seminal moment for me because I realized that my toolbox was not a certificate that I got to validate my memory on some useless questions that, you know, signed by somebody I've never met that's not going to be relevant in how to, you know, interact with the real world. Sure. But instead, my toolbox was this, and my ability to handle uncertainty. And there was one other thing that really came out of that that was a, a massive revelation, and again, you'll instantly understand this, and that is that I remember when I was on the stalls, on the markets, and I was running markets, Sunday markets, yeah, I was doing toy parties yeah, in the evenings. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, and uh, Pete the Toy Boy, and, um, uh, uh, which came true a few times. And so I would stand at the stall, and I would notice on the same, let's say, Thursday, with the same toys, selling to the same demographic, same psychographic, at the same price point, with all things being equal, the variation in how much I would sell or not was correlated to one thing my attitude. And if I was upset and pissed off about something that would like, you know, not fit my pictures, I wouldn't sell as much. And when I was upbeat and happy yeah. about whatever, because I was you know, reacting to outer world, I would sell a lot more. And when I noticed that I started testing it and then I thought, whoa, hang on a minute. Outer world follows inner world. And that set me off on a journey that 30 years later is personal growth. So that was my first business. And out of that came my commitment to being an entrepreneur, and essentially being unemployable for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Wets, what you're saying there is something that I want to get into in a little while. It's, <clears throat> do you use five sensory data to let, does that dictate your world, what's going on outside, or do you actually realize it's actually what's going on on the inside? It's, um, I've been into uh, very recently studying a lot of older stuff by people like Neville Goddard and Raymond Hollywell. On got Neville's complete works knocking around somewhere. Neville, yeah, beautiful. Neville Goddard says, your world is you pushed out. Yeah. And, and, and this has really joined up. I've been listening to this first thing in the morning, at night, uh, in, the, in the taxi, headphones on all the time and just letting it sink in. And it's joined up a lot of dots for me. It really has in the way that we, we fashion. So going back to your blag at the wholesalers there, a lot of people, see when I, when I set up my fish business, I called it, uh, I needed trade accounts. So, so I just thought, Ooh, what shall I call it? Uh, not Steve's fish, I'll call it Eat Well Foods. And I, got, I went to a printer's and I got these little uh, letterheads printed up and business cards. And I remember distinctly my mum laughing and says, well, how can you call it that? See, people who've been in that working nine to five or whatever groove, they, they think you need permission from somebody to do it. Well, how, how can you just call it that? How can you set it up and how can you call yourself that? Well, I just did, guess what, you know? And it's that whole thing. So when you saw that, it's like, um, was it the Van Gogh thing? He says, I, I dream my painting and then I paint my dream, yeah? So you had the vision when you were stood there blagging your ass off at the wholesalers about all the, but it happened a little ways down the road. Yeah, of course. Uh, again, outer world follows inner world, and yeah, and again, I'm a huge fan of Neville Goddard, uh, and yeah, one of the one of the great mystics of the 20th century. But when it comes to yeah, you taking charge, most people are film extras in their own movie. Yeah, and when you wake up to become the star of your own movie and realize that you have the power to create something, now there is artistic license given to the producer. Yeah. <laughs> right? Whichever yeah. label you want to call that, infinite intelligence from Napoleon Hill, yeah, the, the field of possibilities if you're into quantum physics, evolution and uh, circumstance if you're a materialist or God if you're into religion. Yeah, but 
you get to show up on set and have a huge impact on how the script is written and executed. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, it, it is this whole thing, as I said, the whole thing about consciousness. And when you refer to Neville Goddard, yeah, he was referred to as a 20th century mystic, yeah? But I think this thing is come, becoming more and more in the general consciousness now. There are a lot more, there's a lot more conscious awareness of this thing called consciousness, yeah? And I was, um, I was uh, reading a blog from um, a guy called, uh, I think it was Bill Pearl. He was one of the old school 1950s bodybuilders, just Kriano Schwarzenegger Luferino, yeah? And he said yeah. something really interesting. And in he was one of those guys who, he was super strong. He'd blow up hot water bottles and rip up phone directories, you know? Uh, incredible guy. But he said, when we started, um, he said it was considered weird to be into going to the gym, to be doing physical training, to be lifting weights, yeah? Now, after a few years, you know, over 30, 40 years or whatever, it's not normal not to do that. It's considered, if you don't go to the gym, it's weird. So the whole thing's turned right round. And I would sort of transcend that into this whole thing. We call Neville Goddard, he's referred to as a mystic. But I think in a few years to come, it's going to become more of a norm because people are there. I th would you agree at the moment, and I think probably since the 90s, but it's gained more gravitas and more traction in this last five years, that there is a definite shift in world consciousness, in global consciousness going on? Uh, if you'll permit me, I'd like to give a, some contextualization around that because yeah. Yeah, if, we, if we have a model that we can relate to, it gives more understanding. And one of the things that I found in life, Steve, is that context is definitive. You know, if you're a parent and you see a parent, another parent, grab their three-year-old by the arm and snatch them violently across the road, most people would have judgment about that. But if you then realize that they've just pulled them out of the way of a moving bus and risked their own life to do it, you'd have a very different judgment. Same action, very different judgment. Sure. So context is definitive. And so if we put context around this 13-letter anomaly word that you know, most people don't know how to reconcile called consciousness, because you have a continuum here. On one side of the fence, the mainstream materialism reduces it to a byproduct of brain function, which it never is, never will be, has never been proven and can't be because it isn't. Yeah, I'm sorry, the, the brain doesn't produce consciousness any because more than the, the television. Because the brain is an electrical switching station, right? Yeah. It doesn't produce consciousness any more than the television produces programs or a radio writes music. Sure. Right? It doesn't happen. But on the other side of the spectrum, you have this sort of esotericism where it's all like link hands, sing come by R, let's join the divine. Uh, and there's nothing really for the left brain to kind of get its arms around. So people are left confused a lot of the time. We have an inherent sense that there's more to it than just a byproduct of brain function, but we don't have a framework for understanding. But yeah, consciousness is a, if you go to Einstein and he said something exceptionally profound, he said the most powerful question a person can ask or answer in their lifetime uh, is whether or not they live in a friendly or hostile universe. And he was alluding to the fact that yeah, if you have a core inner belief that the universe is inherently friendly, you're going to look at that through a completely different relationship to the Darwinian mentality of survival of the fittest, where everything with teeth is trying to eat you, and therefore it's fear-based. Fight or flight, yeah. But he also said that you cannot solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created the problem. And it was so profound, but people didn't understand or have a framework for it. So I want to throw in... Uh, something that I think would challenge people's belief systems in a way that gives some meaning and contextual understanding to this. Let's go and start with basic science and evolution. You go to 400 million years of fossil records and they tell a pretty yeah, yeah, indisputable story. And that is that life itself, in terms of the forms of expression of life, follow a fairly open trajectory. And that is that they are continually expressing themselves at higher and higher levels of complexity. So we start with an amoeba on one side of the spectrum, single cell organism. I mean, prior to that, you can go into bacteria, but yeah, let's talk a single cell. You go to a human body, which is 50 trillion cells, give or take. Probably some people got a few more after the lockdown. Right? And 
Yeah. What's the difference? If you take 50 tr uh, trillion amoebas and one food source, then you can pretty much sum up what happens with one word. Yeah. War. <laughs> right? Yeah, because it's competition for a single food source. If you take 50 trillion cells in the human body and one food source, you don't have war. You don't have the liver and the kidneys ganging up on the heart and the spleen to get more hemoglobin from the blood. That doesn't happen. So in order to make evolution work, the purpose of what we can see, trying to be rational and look at it observationally, is the purpose of life is to continually evolve into higher levels of complexity, which requires one key thing to make work. One thing. And that is cooperation. Mm -hmm. If you look at humanity at the moment, it resembles yeah, eight different billion individual amoebas competing over stuff. It's like looking at, look at governments. It's like kids in a playground. Uh, he said, she said, I want, this is mine. I'm taking that because I'm bigger than you. All of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But evolution is on a trajectory that we don't get to choose. We only get to participate in or get you know, the feedback of why we're not participating in, which is usually painful. And that is to evolve by going into cooperation rather than competition. Mm -hmm. And if you extrapolate the word cooperation to its logical conclusion, you pretty much hit one word, love. And so what are we really here to do? We're here to raise our own consciousness to a place of love rather than fear. And if you look at any spiritual master, any mystic of old, any uh, um, prophet, all of them have said the same thing in different ways. We're, here to, we're basically here to grow up. And if you look at the evolution of humanity, 2,000 years ago when yeah, one of the master teachers we call Jesus was teaching, you can only hear from the level you're at. So if he says, oh, if somebody hits you, turn the other cheek. Now, if you're calibrating uh, apathy or victim and you have somebody that's watching that that's calibrating a pride or anger, like I said, don't turn the other cheek because to them, uh, at that level, it's acquiescing. It's being submissive. It's yeah, getting yeah, into yeah. a high volume bully. Yeah. Don't get sand kicked in your face. Get up and stand up for yourself. Punch back. And at yeah. that level, it's an appropriate response. But at the level of someone like a Christ, turning around and saying, if somebody hits you, turn the other cheek. It's a strength beyond a strength because it says you can't be hooked by anger. You can't be hooked by judgment. You can't be controlled and provoked. You come at it from a higher sense of compassion, understanding. And you can see the kids today, a far greater number, are asking questions at three, four years old that would no way have been asked three generations ago. Yeah. The level of consciousness of humanity is definitely rising, which gives huge hope to what's going on right now, because I firmly believe that this is a great awakening. It's a great opportunity and all of the lower consciousness levels that have been at their time are going to go kicking and screaming. And we're seeing this now with governments and the lie and the, the, all of the BS around you know, the lockdown and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's just natural shedding skins, cathartic experiences that yeah, evolve. Humanity is going through a kind of a puberty at the level of non-physical. So that, that's yeah. kind of my take. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Great answer. So this this whole thing about consciousness, or um, the way I've um, interpreted it from a few things that I've been into, it's a, it's a bit like a musical stave. Yeah, if you can visualise that, but with many, 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 many like infinite lines of frequency. Yeah which have no separation, there's, there, there's no place where one joins, or they just are, yeah? And so what you're saying is if somebody is vibrating, if their thoughts are keeping them down here, it's like you can't hit a, a bass note if you're, if you're up here on a tenor, that type of thing, or, or an AM, there's no way an AM signal is ever gonna come out of a radio that's tuned into an FM frequency. It's just not gonna happen, is it? If you thought of the AM as the, as the lower consciousness, the FM as the higher consciousness, as a metaphor, yeah? So you've got this, everybody a few years ago was jumping up and down, weren't they, about the law of attraction and, and the film The Secret and the book and, and all that. But I know a load of people who were 
let's just say moderately successful at that time and they got the whole thing wrong they thought right can just down tools not take any action anymore get a nice vision board put a load of pictures up just think about it and, and it'll all happen well it did all happen but it, they went skint what was all that about uh in all fairness a couple of points i'll i'll hit on that i think will be highly relevant that'll segue into that the first is in terms of your analogy of the, the you know, infinite musical octave yeah, scale, absolutely bang on. And there's a challenge that most people forget or they're just not aware of, or they make the false assumption on. And that is that they think that emotional and spiritual maturity and biological maturity are correlated. And they're not. Yeah, you and I probably know uh, a lot of people that are, emotional teenagers running around in very adult bodies yeah. for example and that's not right or wrong yeah you know, what's better a 10 year old or a 15 year old you know, small tree or a big tree there's just no right or wrong they're just at different levels of their own expression of potential so it's easy to get hooked into the spiritual ego of thinking i'm more significant than you because i'm further along but that's just spiritual ego at play, which essentially brings you by definition below the person you're judging. Yeah. But when it comes to uh, things like the law of attraction, again, at the level of consciousness you're at is where you can interpret. So if you are in the place where a lot of achievers are, and you and I have been entrepreneurs for a long time, I've certainly gone through this myself, especially in my 20s. It was all about what can I do to accumulate stuff, i.e. achieve things so that I essentially can prove to the world, my teachers, my friends, my doubters, my naysayers, my brothers, sisters, whatever, mom and dad, that I'm good enough to avoid the insecurities of the fact that I'm scared of not being good enough. Yeah. And so therefore, it's all about self first, excuse me, and other later. As you evolve and mature, and again, you can have some old heads on young shoulders. Uh, it's, it's not correlated to age a lot of the time. Levels of no. consciousness are correlated essentially to lifetimes and how long you've been in earth school and how many classes you've sat. Yeah. But when it comes to um, the, being able to turn around and say, I'm, yeah, I'm growing out of trying to prove myself because I realize that 80% of people don't care about my life and all my problems and the other 20% are glad I have them. Right? Yeah. So it's not about anybody else thinking that I'm the star in my movie because they don't. They're starring in their own and I'm a film extra in their movie. So they yeah, don't that's, care anyway. Exactly. So when I can come from a place of starting to grow up and put other before self and I've become more ethnocentric than egocentric, at that time, I start to mature emotionally. Now, if I'm at the bottom level of class or in the lower part of the class where I'm still thinking, oh, we're attraction, great. What can I get? What can I attract? Well, yeah, you're going you're gonna to find that life doesn't really reward that because it's serving your ego, not your soul. If you're at a higher level of consciousness, you're going to be using the law of attraction for essentially what they were trying to explain, which is, go back to El Nightingale, the classic, yeah, Stranger secret, you become what you think about most of the time. It's basically what it is. Now, if you're thinking of what can I get, life isn't going to reward that because, you know, it's not the purpose of why we're here. You're back to the amoeba rather than the body. Yeah. But when it comes to saying, okay, law of attraction is just one of the rule sets around the non-physical because we know we live in a universe of laws. We know it's mathematical to the point where we can predict the tide 100 years from now. Yeah, there is, a, there is a rule set that governs physical matter reality, and we've managed to, through reverse engineering and observation, essentially identify and delineate the three primary rule sets, which we call physics, chemistry, biology, our three main sciences. And yeah. we've done that to such an extent that we can put a person in orbit or repair the human body. Phenomenal. They work consistently. Gravity doesn't have a day off. Right? It doesn't have a time of the month. Yeah. Yeah. Gra gra it, we don't live in a fun house reality. That would make it hard for us to do what we're here to do, which is learn how to grow. So we've got a strong physical rule set, but guess what? We know in quantum mechanics that the wave gives birth to the particle, not the other way around. In other words, the non-physical is primary, the physical is secondary. Yeah. So just like the parent that gives birth to the child, 
the child has certain characteristics that are essentially remnant of the parent. And you can have a look and deduce. So we look at the physical world has a strong, tight rule set. But the non-physical world has a pretty strict and tight and dependable rule set as well. And all the secret was doing was essentially giving people access to the fact that there is an inner world, there is a non-physical world, and guess what? It also operates by rules. Now, the physical world, actions give consequences. So you walk up and punch somebody, you're going to have a consequence. If you're yeah. bigger than you can punch back or you go to jail or whatever, right? So the thoughts you think in the non-physical have very tangible consequences. And that was one of the great things about The Secret, was it basically says, listen, forget the physical diet. The most important diet you want to be concerned with is the thoughts you're thinking, not the food you're eating, because that has a bigger impact on your overall life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, good, good, good explanation. Yeah. Um, I, I, I broke, I like playing with words, and I broke down. Uh, it just jumped out at me, actually. When you see the word attraction, I've just written it down here to remind myself. There's different words in there. There's obviously attract by what we're talking about in terms of our inner, inner thoughts that we concentrate and then try and project those thoughts into the, let's call it the quantum field, yeah, to get them to come into reality, to manifestation. There's a word, and the more you do that, the more traction you'll get, that word's in there as well. But then within the word, the end of the word, you've got this word called action as well. You've got to physically back it, the whole thing up to make it work by taking physical actions, yeah? So it's like a symbiosis, yeah? The two things working, yeah, ha hand in hand. So- Hidden in plain sight is the, is the elusive obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's just uh, let's let's just back up a second to your uh, go back into your entrepreneurial career. So you had the toy business, 17, 18 years old. What were you? What were your mid twenties as a as a? Because I think I met you when you were about 28 or 29. So I know you'd been into property. You'd been into uh, running uh, health foods and gyms and supplements. How did how did all that come about, Pete? Well, I mean, I, as I said, I'm unemployable. My, my trade is I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I do. And the primary skill set of an entrepreneur, if you want to sum it up, the ability to handle uncertainty. Mm. Uh, and so I'm a lousy CEO. I'm very open about that. I'm not a detail-orientated person. I need detail people to mop up the mess after me. I'm, I'm the visionary that creates a whirlwind and a storm. And then, yeah, if people can, like, uh, follow me with a, a dustpan and brush and put some order into the chaos, then great. We, we make a good team. But so I was very much, again, as I said, in my early 20s, trying to uh, prove to the world I was good enough to cover up the insecurities as a young man that I wasn't. And I made the classic mistake that I see many CEOs today make you know, in their 50s that realize that they're too late often that there is a massive difference between a life-chasing success and a life-chasing fulfillment. Mm. And the two are very different. And so for me, I was definitely on the success path. You know, I bought my first Ferrari for cash at 25. I was flying Concorde. I was staying in the best hotels. I was doing all sorts of stuff that my friends would look at me and go, wow, you've made it. But inside, I was so insecure. I'm like, no, I mean, I thought when I make my first million, I'll make it. And of course, what happens? You make your first million. And then you think, well, now clearly I still have the same insecurities. So I know I need two million in case I lose the first. But that's, would you say that's all ego-driven, significance-driven um, you, you, it's, it really is significant. So, you know, when you say about the first million, I'm, I met a guy years ago who sold a, sold a business, very well-known business, I won't mention what it was, and his lifelong dream had to be by a, by a sun seeker, yeah? So he invites me on the sun seeker down in Beaulieu Sumer in the south of France, and the guy's proud as punch. It was a beautiful boat, 60 odd foot long, fantastic. We had a bottle of champagne, about three actually. Um, all that sort of thing, yeah? But within a few weeks, the guy was dissatisfied. Why was he dissatisfied? Because a few weeks later, a Russian guy parked up a boat next to his, which was about five times as big. So if you want to put it in, count in, in housing terms, he thought he'd bought a mansion, but realized he'd got a grotty old council house, you know, in comparison. Now he's on the lookout to go and buy bigger and better to be as significant as his neighbor. Chasing them all. And it's, 
it never ends. Like, see, I work with, you know, I, I do high-end coaching for CEOs at this level. And you know, I work with people worth $700 million that are miserable as hell because they're not a billionaire yet. And people find that almost hard. But you know, if you were to go back to the 15, 16 year old version of you, right? And anyone watching or listening to this, if you go back to yeah, the, the sort of school version of you, you know, pre-college, and you were to tell that school version of you what you were earning right now, what you were doing, the places you'd been, the place you were living in, everything else, that young version of you would probably go, wow, you made it. You actually, did, wow, yeah. that's awesome. I would take that card out of the deck and keep it as an ace every day of the week. But of course, we still don't feel that way for, for most people because they're still chasing them all. And the classic mistake, and I'll give you an analogy which I've shared with, with a lot of people that's made a, a huge revelation and difference. And I call it the curse of the white rabbit. And if you're familiar with a, a classic dog track, uh, you open the trap, the dogs run. Why do the dogs run? Because they're chasing a white rabbit yeah, around the track. Now, the obvious question is, do the dogs ever catch the rabbit? Well, clearly not. But why? Is it because they're not fast enough? No, because if they go super fast, they just turn the speed of the rabbit up. Yeah, is it because they have the wrong diet? Is it because they don't sleep in the best kennel? I have the best... No, it's because the game is rigged specifically so that they can never catch the rabbit. Yes. Now, where's the correlation here? Most entrepreneurs, people in life are chasing rabbits on the track that they can't catch, not because they're not a good enough entrepreneur, not because they're not good enough at discipline and setting goals, but by design, the game is rigged so that understand that you will never ever catch the rabbit of fulfillment by running on the track of achievement. The two are very different, they're different games. And if you oh, yeah. come to the point where the greyhounds at the end of the race, if you ever see them, they are ecstatic, they're happy, they're, why? They got to run, it's what they're born for. Right? Entrepreneurs build businesses because that's what we do. It's what we're born for. We're happy, win, lose. But if we confuse and make the fatal mistake of combining our self-worth with our net worth, then we're always going to be chasing that more. Instead of saying, you know, if I lose everything tomorrow, it'd be a damn good excuse to go again because you know, I've never seen a hearse with a roof rack. Yeah? You're never going to take it with you. So <laughs> yeah, if, if you come to the awareness that now, how do you break the curse of the white rabbit? Because even if you achieve the goal, like me with my, first, my Ferrari Testarossa at 25, yeah, proud as punch, like your yeah. guy with the Sun Seeker for about three weeks. The, what the brain doesn't tell you, now only in hindsight, is this, that my joy at being able to achieve the car, most of that is the relief that I'm no longer running. Yes, I got there. It's like crossing the finish line of a marathon. I made it, but sooner or later, you want to run another marathon. Yeah. Because you're a runner, right? And so for me, it was understanding that, whoa, when I first realized, and luckily I was in my late 20s when this awareness really became congruent. And that is, how do you break the curse of the white rabbit? You come to the indisputable conclusion that you already are that which you seek. That's a very good, uh, good set of metaphors and a, and a profound answer. I mean, here's the thing. I've noticed with a lot of people in my life that I, mean, I, well, I take myself, you know that, that book, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, yeah? And it's all about living in the moment and, and that sort of thing and being in the moment and absorbing everything. I'm almost a bit too good at that by default, yeah? I'm a, I'm a happy guy. I mean, I'm happy. I've had all sorts of things go on recently, but I'm happy. Wait, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm breathing in the morning, guess what? I'm happy. If I'm not aching too much from the gym, I'm, I'm, even if I am, I'm happy. I'm content. But I think a lot of people, because of the environmental conditioning, and especially social media and kids now, People, they're, they're always chasing that more, always want to be a Kardashian, always want to be a whoever it is. And they just lack the capacity just to be happy, just to be happy because you're fucking breathing. You know what I mean? And, and, and it's that that really frustrates me that I can't get over to a lot of people. Just say, can't you just be happy and content? 
you, you, you touch on two key points. Uh, the first is that what stops people being happy is not external circumstances. It is the rules they have around what has to happen in order for themselves to give themselves permission to be happy. And if you set up the game that I'll be happy when, you're playing a game of what I call feel great when. And that will never ever materialize. I'm sorry, I'll feel great when I make my first million. Didn't. Feel great when I make my first Ferrari. Three weeks later, didn't. Feel great when fill in the blank. It'll never happen. The key to life is to play the game of feel great now. Oh, but I just lost my business. Feel great now because, you know, as I said, everything in the physical world by definition means that its destination is non-physical. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? What game do you think you're playing? I need to prove to the world that doesn't really care that I'm good enough when I was born good enough. Yeah. Wake up. Now, if uh, and the second challenge here, Steve, is that we've been sold on the happiness illusion, the dream. If people want the yeah you know, the secret of happiness, you know, bonus for them. Forty odd minutes in. Thanks for waiting, guys. Now you get some good stuff. Here's the secret of being happy. You want a secret to be happy? I'll give it to you. Think happy thoughts. There you go. Done. Oh, no, I want a complicated formula that you know, I, I yeah, can yeah, then yeah. Bl blame the formula for when it doesn't work rather than understand the profundity of what I just said. Yeah. But no, happiness is nothing more than a byproduct of you thinking happy thoughts. Thoughts produce neuropeptides, chemicals. Every thought you think produces a, a chemical. Yeah. How, you, neuro how, how you feel, basically, yeah? That goes into the bloodstream and produces a feeling which we call an emotion, which then triggers a thought and we get into a cycle. So thinking happy thoughts which, is the way to be which happy. Which ultimately determines our frequency, our vibration, right? Exactly. Although you also have a state of consciousness and a stage of consciousness. Stage is where you live. A state is where you visit. So yeah. it's possible for depressed people to be happy, but they'll revert to where they live rather than where they visit. It's like okay. health is a, a, an analogy, right? Yeah, uh, you and I, we live in the gym, which means we can visit Hagen Dars once in a while and it's yeah. not going to do anything, right? People that live on the couch with popcorn and hamburgers, yeah, they can visit the gym once in a while. It ain't going to do anything, right? So where do you live? Where do you visit? And if you do visit too often, you'll end up living there. So be careful. But the big misnomer here is that we're sold on the dream that it's our job to be happy. It isn't. Happiness is one emotion out of the entire spectrum, which is human beings were designed to experience everything. I didn't want to be happy, Steve, at my mom's funeral. Yeah. No. But I was Same. fulfilled. I was complete. And yes, I went into grief because it was a natural cathartic expression at that point to express, come to completion with and move on. It's every yeah. parent's wish that their children outlive them and she got her wish. Yeah. So, yeah, we never get to choose when. It's always too soon. But that's part of life. Yeah. But when it comes to, that's why I said, when it comes to fulfillment and joy, that's a different game to chasing happiness. Happiness is a transitory byproduct of thinking happy thoughts, which is great. But if your default state is one of joy, then you're on a different track. Yeah? When you come from a place of not being hooked, you can't be pushed, pulled, cajoled, influenced, because... You're rising above the drama that most people are running around trying to be happy with or filling insecurities with. Oh, as, I said, with as I life. said to somebody the other day who has a, a, a life of high drama, I said, dude, we've got Netflix, we've got Amazon Prime, we've got all these things now. You I said, there's enough drama on these channels for me when I want to tune into it. I don't want any in my own life. I'm not inviting any. I'm not getting any. Uh, overspilling into my uh, own life. Reminds me there when you say about the McDonald's, uh, the Big Mac um, analogy of the person, you know, who orders like five Big Macs, goes large on the fries, 3X, milkshakes and that, and says, oh, I, I better have a salad on the side with that because I'm slimming. <laughs> you know? Del delusional. <laughs> so do you watch, um, do you ever watch, do you watch Billions? Uh, I don't, I, I'm, I'm virtually zero TV, to be fair. And again, probably like yourself, I've not watched a news report in 18 years nearly. But, so, um, so, oh, so I, I love this show, Billions, yeah? And this, this hedge fund trader guy, very ego-driven guy, played by Damien Lewis. His name's Bobby Axelrod. And at the beginning of season five, he's with his sidekick, uh, and... Um, 
He's just got into, and like Vanity Fair and Vogue are doing a, a big thing on all the people who've just become 10x billionaires, yeah? Uh, and just going back to what you were saying a, a few moments ago, he's completely unfulfilled. He said that he thought when, when he hit 10 billion, he'd feel ecstatic. And he said to his, his utmost confidant, yeah, his sidekick guy, he said, I don't feel any better for getting to hitting the 10 billion mark than I did when I was a kid, when I was broke and I found $20 on the street. He said, I don't feel any better, you know? Yeah. I, I, I got more joy getting my first supercar at 23 than any of the supercars I bought since. Because again, it was like a new, oh wow, I've got a reference for making it. Yeah, it was my Ferraris, my McLaren, but it's like, no, it was just, it's just, an, just a something. It doesn't validate you. And again, lose everything tomorrow, which I have several times. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't change who I am. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to bury it next to me. Yeah, I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. That's the wrong game to play. Yeah. And, and again, if, if you're going to encourage people to remind themselves that we don't get to vote whether or not we get programmed. As human beings, psychocybernetic organisms, we are programmable by design. So... That doesn't, that, that doesn't change. So. What we do get to choose is how we get programmed. And, uh, and I call it OPD, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a strict yeah, no OPD yeah, policy. Other people's drama. Yeah. Because, yeah, they, they, will, they will define themselves by their problems. They will connect and get what I call secondary gain through how, yeah, they don't have significance with how much money they've got in their own mind, even if they're a billionaire, yeah, because they're not 10 yet, yeah, 10x. Yeah, they don't get significance from what, yeah, their parents told them they were good enough enough times. So, oh, but if I have a significant story, yeah, then I can connect with that. Yeah. And as Tony Robbins said, and as you know, I worked with Tony for 15 years. Yeah, what stops people getting them from what they want isn't their skills, it's not their... Uh, opportunities, it's not the circumstances, it's the story they keep telling themselves as to why they can't have it. It's, 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 it's the voice, yeah. You know, I, uh, I mean, we could, we could talk for hours and I know we haven't got hours. How much longer have we got, by the way, till you've got to be on your next uh, interview or Zoom call? About nine minutes. About nine minutes, yeah, okay. But he, he also said, I mean, going back to that word you use, uncertainty, and it's kind of an obvious thing, but he put it very well, didn't he, Big Tony, that uh, the quality of your life will be in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty that you can comfortably handle at any one time. And people are conditioned to that they really need certainty. We live in a world now where people, I mean, this really pisses me off. People send you a text message to ask you if they can text you later to arrange when it will be okay to call you instead of just picking up the fucking phone and calling you, you know? So it, we live in this very sort of, we've all been conditioned to be very safe and un, don't intrude on anyone, don't upset anyone, you know? It's a complete load of bullshit. But the more you get conditioned, like recent events by the media, you just see the power of having this shit go into people's heads 24 seven. I walk down the street now, you know, walking down a, um, a tunnel to one of the shopping centers here a few days ago, guys, and it's a wide tunnel, the guys like on the wall to avoid me, you know, what's, <laughs> what's going on? It's crazy. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, virtually predictable. And I, I, I put a video out right at the start of this whole global issue. Yeah. Right, way before, before lockdowns and everything else, it's on my channel. And yeah, I said, listen, What's going on right now? I want to give you a couple of insights. I said, for a start, don't make the intellectually dumb mistake of confusing popularity for truth. All right, that's number one. I said, the second thing you want to make sure that you're aware of is that you're not confusing the medium of the message for authority on the message. Right? Because the mainstream media have only one agenda, eyes on, uh, and then driven from higher levels of you know, whatever sure. uh, rabbit hole you want to run down. But you know, fear typically has been used throughout history to control populations, right? And they're doing a pretty damn good job of it right now, which is why, as I said, be the star of your own Sterling movie. Job. Don't get sucked into being an unpaid film extra in the Corona movie because it's a pretty poor career choice as an actor. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but the thing about cliches is that they're very often true. The, the old acronym, false evidence, fake evidence appearing real, yeah? Which is yeah. what fear very often is, you know, do, do, do the thing that you fear most and it goes away, doesn't it, you know? That's, that's the old thing. So as we're, as we're short on time, quickly, I'm very often, when I go out for a run, and I'm, um, when I'm out for a run and I'm tempted to, uh, to give up, I think of you. In fact, I thought of you. I was running the London Marathon at the same time as you were running the uh, five-day marathon in the desert, Marathon des Sables. When was that? Back in 2004, five, something like yeah. that? Somewhere around there, a seven-day marathon. Somewhere around there. And at about 17 miles, I quote-unquote hit the wall and I was tempted to give up. And then I thought, mm, can't. Pete's doing this, five of these, one day, two marathons back-to-back, -back, and he's doing it in the Sahara Desert with a backpack on it. And then I saw a crippled guy at the side of me as well. Just quickly tell me about that experience in, in one minute. What, what did it mean for you? Uh, great lessons. And yeah, I, I originally started, it was the toughest foot race in the world. It's actually seven marathons back to back uh, uh, and um, with day four being a double marathon. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was seven days. Just and days. yeah. As you do, across yeah. the hardest terrain in the world, carrying, say, 20 kilos, all self-sufficient, water's rationed at nine liters a day. That's for washing, cooking, hydrating and running 42 kilometers in 50 Celsius. Yeah. And uh, sub-zero at night. do a bare grills if you run out of drinking water. Yeah, not going to do that. <laughs> But, um, but no, I, I started that predominantly, I think, out of ego. It was the toughest foot race in the world. Yeah, let's do it. What I learned about myself yeah, running that, because again, yeah, we both ran London probably several times. Uh, 30,000 people lining the streets, cheering you on. Out in the desert, if you see a camel, you're lucky. Yeah, it's, yeah there's nothing. It's all inner work. And so the biggest lesson I got from that was on the day of the double marathon, where I basically was about to quit. I got food poisoning from uh, the night before. Uh, I was still got 30 miles to run that day. I, uh, I ran, uh, no, sorry, I, I ran 30 miles, wow. another 20, mile, 20 miles to run through the night. And I was about to quit. And I saw an old blind Korean guy trudge past me, tied at the wrist to his guide as a competitor. I'm like, whoa, what, what possesses somebody who's a pensioner, not an athlete? can't even see where to place his feet, want to run the toughest foot race in the world. And, and I caught up with him and, and found out through his interpreter that every single year he ran this race to raise money for the hospice that had looked after his brother dying of cancer. Wow. And I'm like, if ever I needed a reminder about what I said earlier, about life will reward you when you're ethnocentric over egocentric, and when it's about other rather than self. And he inspired me. He just, you know, I no longer wanted to run the race to blag or brag to some girl in a bar that you know, I could do it. It was all about how many people can I inspire, uh, including one guy I didn't know I was inspiring at the time running the London Marathon, apparently. So thank yeah. you. So even, yeah. uh, e even like 15 years later nowadays, you still use that as an anchor sometimes, yeah, that guy? It's a contrast frame. It's like, hang on a minute. Okay, they're just, no, not now, but let's just say, oh, they put interest rates up or the bank's calling in my line. Hey, if I can run several hundred kilometers across the Sahara Desert. I can handle a freaking decision by the bank. Give me a break. Yeah, so it's, it's a great contrast frame to be able to build. Sure, sure. And so your, your, latest, um, your latest offering or latest product or service course is called EMF, yeah? Uh, which is, which is um, targeting or aimed at high level, stressed out, middle-aged executives, yeah, who've, to use that phrase that I just borrowed a minute ago, hit the wall, yeah? Do you want to explain for anybody, especially our people on LinkedIn, I think we might have a few executives who maybe just be a little bit stressed out from recent events, how EMF, Peter Sage and EMF can help those people break through that? Okay, I appreciate that. Again, one of the things that I, I spend a lot of time now is doing is high level coaching. And again, that comes from a background with 15 years with Tony Robbins. We are working closely around the world, um, 30 years in personal growth, but also 30 years as an entrepreneur. And one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of stressed out execs, professionals, or glass ceiling, yeah, or yeah, fulfillment missing, but success rich, uh, is that yeah, if they go to see a, a therapist or a normal coach, most of them have no clue about the inner trenches of business. You know, I've built multiple seven-figure companies from scratch. I know the game. Most business owners and fellow peers in that group aren't 
experts in human behavior and psychology. So there's generally a mismatch. So my skill set essentially blends the two to navigate that path out at the fastest possible way. And I can do it privately, high level one-on-one, -on -one, which I only have less than a handful of private clients any one time. Or I created the Elite Mentorship Forum EMF to take people through a six-month group coaching program that is designed to do one thing predominantly and without getting too esoteric here because it's not it's designed to raise your emotional maturity it's designed to bring you out of the drama yourself or other people's drama so rather give you the skill set the inner skill set that'll allow you to change the outer world because mm -hmm. inner world leaves outer world and it's highly affordable for a six-month program uh, and you build a peer group of like-minded people that become friends for life like a, almost a fraternity but a high conscious because you know, I know, you become who you hang with. Yeah, you, know, you hang around with 10 recreational drug users, chances are you'll become the 11th. You, know, you hang around with 10 motivated, high conscious people that look at life through how we can, not why we can't, you're gonna become the 11th. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. There's information on my website, petersage.com. Um, I put a whole load of resources out there from free to yeah, my book, Inside Track, which is a, a masterclass in handling adversity, right through to say my private high level coaching one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, for athletes or CEOs or billionaires, uh, right through the group coaching program and everything in between. So yeah, that's that's what I, I'm passionate about. That's and what that's I'm doing, good. and I appreciate so the I, opportunity. Yeah. I, I know one of one of one of the best, well, one of the best known, most well known sagisms, if I may call it that, is upgrade your peer group. Yeah, it's everything. As I say, you become who you hang with, and for entrepreneurs, a lot of the time or high level execs, it's a lonely road. You know, when you were walking back into the pub, yeah, with your uh, eat well fish yeah, business, yeah, yeah, or eat well foods, a lot of your friends, you're saying, hey, look, I've made it, you know, bags of cash in your pocket. Most of them were resentful. They didn't understand it. They still think you're mad or lucky waiting for you to fall down. And for CEOs and entrepreneurs, that's usually been a lonely ride. And so being able to get with a high quality peer group that can hold you accountable, keep your standards high and be yeah, led from a place of experience uh, we're finding is massively invaluable and massively beneficial and transformational. Yeah, yeah, it, it was funny. I mean, just just in conclusion, because I'm guessing you've got to shoot off uh, any moment now, but uh, somebody I know from completely somewhere else, I was having a conversation with um, only, I think it was last week, and he said, look, um, I'm going to be a little bit focused for the next few months on something. Yeah, I said, okay, yeah, fair enough. We can reconnect then. I said, what is it out of interest? He said, look, I've been around personal development for 29 years. Yeah, um, I've built big businesses. And yet here I am back in my middle 50s, spinning my wheel, driving a freaking truck. Yeah. He said, so I've invested in this course, it's six months long. I mean, this is absolute amazing coincidence. He says, I've invested in this course, it's six months long. He said, I've just done the first week's module. And, and to quote him, if you'll excuse my French, he said, it's blown my fucking mind, yeah? He said, this has connected so many dots for me. I can't believe it. I can't believe where I've been, what I've what I've missed. I said, "Oh, that sounds fantastic! Congratulations!" As what's uh, what what's the course then? What what is it? He said, "Have you ever heard of a guy called Peter Sage?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I could have done, could have done." Touching, and, and it's hearing it's, messages like that, Steve, that keep me doing what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the satisfaction when you turn somebody's lights on is. You can't put it in monetary terms, can you? It's amazing when, when you do that. Pete, look, thank you so much. Elite Management Forum, um, everything else. We'll do another one of these soon to cover what we couldn't talk about because I know you're super busy. Thanks for uh, chipping in and joining me today, mate. Pleasure to be on the QCAS, Steve, and keep doing what you're doing too. It's, uh, I love your style. You're one of the best wordsmiths I've ever met and uh, a great example of human potential at your age too. So keep shining, brother. Thanks, man. See you later, Pete. Bye-bye.